<clears throat> well, I guess we're about there. So um, my name is Charlie Doobie um, and I am the head of regenerative partnerships for Agrology. Thanks so much for being here on this webinar. We're really excited to host Eric Morgan of Braga Fresh. Um, he'll give himself a, a bigger and better intro than I can. Um, but before we start, I just wanted to do a little bit of an introduction and some housekeeping before we jump into uh, the questions. Um, so first off, this is a part of a series of webinars that we're holding um, that are on pressing topics in regenerative agriculture. Uh, if you're interested in pre, you know, viewing the previous webinars, uh, we have one on soil carbon quantification methods, as well as smoke taint analysis in vineyards. You can find these recordings on our website, uh, which is agrology.ag, and it's under the About menu. Um, we're holding another webinar next month with Anna Britton from Napa Green, and we'll be discussing the world of regenerative certifications and kind of just diving into that whole matrix. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, please keep yourself on mute. Uh, please write any questions or comments that you have in the chat, and we will get to the questions in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, and also feel free to engage in a conversation in the chat. We really love to see um, you know, a lively discussion in there. A recording will be sent out to everyone who registered, um, and we'll also post that on our website. And lastly, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is charlie at agrology.ag. If you have any questions or comments, um, or you know, just want to discuss how we can support you in your regenerative journey. Um, all right, and with that, we will start the questions. Um, first off, Eric, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Um, my first question was, can you give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself, some background um, on you and, and your history at Braga Fresh? Okay, so we'll go back a little bit before Braga Fresh, but Eric Morgan, Vice President, Environmental Science and Resources for Braga Fresh, arrived in the Salinas Valley in, in early summer 1996 and started working for SoilServe. Braga was still a pretty small uh, a grower at that time, not a shipper, not a processor. Uh, Rodney Braga has been really instrumental in growing the company, you know, in the, in the time, period of time that I've been there. Um, fast forward 2001, I left uh, SoulServe to become an independent pest control advisor, and that continued till about 2010 when I went in-house uh, for Braga because there was a, a growing need to comply and analyze and, and work on the sustainability um, side of things. And, and really that started with the responsibly grown program that Whole Foods launched. Um, and so I became Vice President of Environmental Science and Resources at that time. Also in 2009, 2009 uh, I started working in soils and uh, Soil Health Lab is the result of that. And we've been doing that since 2009, offering same-day nitrate, ammonium, and pH results. Um, we send out and cooperate with a number of other labs for complete soil analysis. And then also our, our favorite thing now is SAP analysis, and we're partnered with new age labs there, but the sustainability side at, at Braga has just kind of really, really grown. Um, initially it was, you know, Whole Foods really pushing the envelope and it kind of gave us some, some goalposts of what our retail partners would be looking at in the future. Um, it, it feels like Whole Foods de-emphasized that. However, it seems like it's being re-emphasized again and Walmart really took up, um, you know, all those endeavors and has really been pushing us and really data focused on um, what we're doing in terms of sustainability, whether it's CO2 and, and just every other metric that uh, looking at food loss. And, and there's just so many different things that are kind of falling into the sustainability thing. So uh, a lot of learn by doing. Um, I'm just a pest control and a certified pest control advisor and a certified crop advisor with a pretty basic understanding of soils, um, but really excited about what we've done our on our rege regenerative journey and you know, the last three years and where we might be going with that. And really the partnership with agrology started at an excellent time for us to start to look at data and to see how our practices influence our CO2 emissions. So that's a, a little basic introduction. Awesome. Well, that leads really well into my next question, which is what was the original motivation behind doing these regenerative trials at Braga Fresh? Um, and who came up with that? And how did they convince the ownership of the value of these trials? So uh, I've I've been fixated on tillage for well over 10 years and even approached our farm advisor, Richard Smith. I said, hey, can we do no-till vegetables? And he said, no. 
and he was kind of right. Um, but it didn't really stop me from thinking about it. I think tillage seems to be for our market, you know, cool season, um, annual produce. It seems like tillage is kind of the common denominator between a lot of the environmental concerns that are, um, that we're creating, uh, whether it's groundwater, surface water, um, there's so many different things that we have an impact on because of tillage. And so I started to focus on tillage and didn't really kind of sat on the back burner, but then we saw the kiss the ground documentary and everybody in the operation, me being kind of the technical lead is, Hey, Eric, what do you think about this? I'm like, ah, I don't know. And then I approached our CEO, this would be over three years ago. And I said, Hey, so everybody's kind of asking about this. Do you want to try? And we, we did really kind of no till to start, um, and I said, you want to try this? And he's like, ah, I don't know. And then I mentioned that, you know, carbon markets are going to be an emerging, you know, potential revenue source. And we're always looking at getting additional revenue um, into the operation. And, and his degree is in finance, grew up on the farm, but fortunately, you know, has a finance degree. And so when we started talking about additional revenue back to the business, he became excited and has been very supportive. And on top of that, Really, his growing experience has really um, been beneficial. You know, you can see behind us that we're now planting an annual grass in the center of our 80 inch beds. And that wasn't my idea. That was his idea. He said that we need to be able to get roots deep in the soil to keep the soil open. So he brought that concept. And and when we were trying to figure out tillage, um, he showed up and told us how to do it right, and, you know, and, and still accomplish the goal. So our CEO has been really supportive. Um, and as it kind of progresses, you know, we're getting a lot of support from our retail partners as well. Um, a lot of, uh, inquiries from, you know, people in the industry and even, you know, outside of our market as well, trying to see what we're doing. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of turned into a lot of fun, uh, looking at a way, you know, we have a great team. And some of them are here today too. Even people on the team that aren't employed by Brogger are, are really important. We consider Agrology one of those partners too. But um, it's a big team effort and um, it's ending up being a lot more fun because we're optimistic about what we're doing. Um, and it's everybody's pretty excited about, you know, the direction that we're taking this. Awesome. Well, with that, let's dive into what you're actually doing. Yeah. If you could give us an overview, um, you can get as detailed or undetailed as you'd like. Um, what are you what are the practice changes that you're you're doing in these regenerative trials? And the Holly, main, I think if you want to pull up the the photos at this point. Okay, so this is kind of our latest evolution. So we'll start here and work backwards. So this is part of our hundred thousand dollar uh, state sponsored healthy soils grant and kind of the history on this is that kind of initially we were going to be transitioning 38 acres of conventional prime Salinas Valley farmland from conventional to organic. Um, but really by the time we started farming it, it was organic. So that kind of aspect is gone, but this field was primarily in a cover crop for, you know, the two, two years uh, before, uh, we planted this crop and really the distinctions is going to be how much we've limited tillage. And so what we're looking at right here would be one of the regenerative uh, treatments. And so this is not seen any deep tillage in, in 18 months. Um, but what we did is we came out of the cover crop and we used a Wilcox performer and we modified the Wilcox performer um, so that when we move forward, we can leave our planted grass in the center of the bed and plant our crops on the outside of it. So what you're seeing here came out of cover crop, no deep tillage. Um, in fact, we were, we have uh, software and instruments on our larger tractors, John Deere 6000 series and above called IntelliCulture. And so we're able to determine with runtime and RPM diesel consumption based on the specs from the manufacturer. And when we did the math last time, we were at 800 pounds less CO2 emitted per acre with our regenerative treatment when compared to our standard tillage treatment. So we might have six passes through this field to get it planted where we had 18 to 25 passes on the other field. So, um, you know, we, we have a savings in, in, in labor. We have a savings in diesel. We have a savings in, you know, depreciation and in, in use on the tractors. 
Um, and so we're really excited about this. But what you're seeing is that when we talk about eliminating deep tillage, we have to find a way to continue to facilitate the aeration and drainage that our crop needs. That's why we do our, our deep tillage operations. And that's really the, the benefit of tillage in general. And so when we look at a, a biological way to do that, we know that our cover crops that we grow, and we started with Merced rye, but we've now changed to a sedan sorghum uh, hybrid during the summer. We know that when we plant a cover crop, um, that the roots go down really deep. You know, it's it's not uncommon, and we've seen it when we've dug some holes to find, you know, roots down eight feet after a ryegrass cover crop. It's amazing how deep they go. And I think is it you, Charlie, that uh, saw that article online about just it's preposterous the amount of roots they put down there. So those cover crop roots are picking up nutrients that we leach beyond our our, our cash crop bringing them up to the surface, adding adding carbon, labile carbon back to the soil, which is great microbe food, and, and providing the aeration and drainage that we would normally do for tractors. And it, it's not been without struggle. Um, and, and still, we're going to be struggling here and there. But thank God, my CEO, Rod Braga, told me, he said, Eric, he said, you got to talk about the failures because this is not easy and we're not going to learn without failures. And so there has been a lot of failures uh, we did pretty well on the crop in the image below. We had no yield drag, but on other ground, on our marginal ground across the street, which is a decomposed granite that they actually use a similar soil for road base just a couple miles south of us. We planted the Sudan sorghum hybrid early, and now it's just far too tall, and the sprinklers are not penetrating it. Um, and so it's kind of a similar setup on a on a, a bad piece of ground, but you know we're seeing that the Sudan sorghum is seven or eight feet tall, and the sprinklers just don't go through that. So, you know, lesson learned: we're getting two hundred cartons per acre, which is just horrible yield, probably fifteen to twenty percent of standard yield. Um, but the solution to that is to run drip tape next time. So it really is an iterative process where we um, failure we fail. And, and we learn from it. So moving forward, when we have these types of things, we're going to be making sure that uh, we have some drip tape out there. So um, my screen just changed. All right. I do that. You still hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, what is the slide that you have up right now? Because my screen, my screen. We're looking at the insectaries. Insectary. Okay. So that yeah, it, it, we kind of started off with um, the the mindset of being no till, but then really changed the mindset to be standard tillage, but really augmented and targeted to where we're really working the soil six to eight inches deep, and only in the area that we plant, trying to leave the rest of it undisturbed, and that's been pretty workable for us. And I think that we're going to continue on down that path. I'm just trying to get the rest of my screen here. I don't know why it minimized on me. While you're doing that, I found that nugget about uh, just how deep and how, how much roots um, a single rye plant can put out. It's pretty wild. So they say that uh, a single rye plant has more than 13 million rootlets with a combined length of 680 miles. And then each rootlet is covered with root hairs, roughly 14 billion of them, with a combined length of 6,600 miles. So again, just emphasizing uh, just how massive that rooting system is, and that's of a single plant. Yeah, and, and, we, and, and, and really what we see is that when you have, we drain better when we have a companion planter. I think that we're getting better, better aeration too. And so it actually, you know, I, I say this and it's a little bit corny, but roots are tillage. And the roots facilitate that that drainage and aeration, which is why we do our tillage so much better than what we're seeing with our standard tractor work. And and I think it's evident every year. We know we we cover crop a third of our ground, which is a really high percentage, um, you know, for for vegetables. You know, probably surpassing everybody by about tenfold. But we see that once that cover crop is established, we don't discharge water off that ground, even if it has a slope, even if, you know, that soil has a tendency to seal up. So um, really integrating cover crops or kind of that that thought process into the vegetable production, you know, season um, has been has been great. Um, and, and really, you know, along that we've been trying to be good stewards for a long time and, and re really rely 
on on beneficial insects and in in you're seeing some habitat that we have planted and fortunately this is next to my office and it was at peak and so this is you know refuge for pollinators and beneficial insects too so we rely on a lot of our pest control to come from other nature and so we've been doing this now for 15 or 20 years we have these patches everywhere we also have transplants in the middle of the field um, and I, I think that we're doing it right because we actually have, you know, an apiary on the ranch too. And I think we're up to 30 boxes now, something like that. Um, and we're able to, you know, keep bees on the farm in addition to doing our normal farming operations. And, and with this, you know, diverse habitat that we have planted everywhere, um, it's a great food and um, habitat source for them. But what we're also seeing is when we have that, that Sudan sorghum, Every 80 inches is a windbreak. We're seeing a lot more beneficial insects out there. I, I think that they don't like the wind. The Salinas Valley is very windy and we're getting a real good windbreak. And so it seems like they're more active. And actually we see that the weather is a little bit different in there with that windbreak. It's a little warmer um, because the wind's not coming through. So um, we like what we're learning um, and, and can't wait to learn more. Um, but it's been- And these are permanent. Correct, Eric. These are permanent yeah, these are sectors. permanent, and yeah, and so we'll mow it and we'll take it out and replant it. But you know, they're usually in for for three years when they start to. I mean, a lot of them are mostly perennials, um, mm -hmm. but even perennials start to get a little funky after you know three or four years. So we'll we'll, we'll mow them, you know, a few times and bring them back. But um, you know, just planting them, we have a number of different mixes that we can we can choose. Ellie Hearn does a great job of mixing those up for us. But we're also finding, too, as we start to look at it, we have an intern and our intern, Jalen Calbro, is actually looking at all the different beneficial species that we're planting. We're finding that we have, uh, you know, less, we have the, des we're not finding thrips and ligus, very undesirable insect pests on the natives. So we're going to start looking at natives more now, too, so that we're not just a host for, you know, for food for our beneficial insects, but trying to move out of being a host for the insects that we don't want, want as well. So um, continuing to learn, you know, a lot. So um, a little more focus on natives going forward, I think. Great. Next slide, Holly. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, this, yeah. That's so we're, I, I can find I can never find my way around in the Imperial Valley. It's flat and it's long and it's hard to find those ranches and I'm not down there enough, but I can always find our fields because I think we're the only growers right now that are planting habitat down there. So this is from El Centro and this is just sweet alyssum um, adjacent to some romaine down there, some organic romaine. So we've been doing this down there, you know, some, some sustainable efforts down there as well and have had some really great success on some cover crop trials that uh, the researcher is going to try to expand and get uh, healthy soils grant funding for because it's kind of groundbreaking. So Amazing. Maybe we can dig into that a little bit later. Okay, great. Did we cover that one question enough, Charlie, or do you want me to keep talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I think that's, you definitely I'll covered just, it. I'll just add that we do, so in addition to the Sudan sorghum in the center of the bed, uh, we are planting a balanza clover in the furrow. Um, it, this year, we didn't do a great job. I think that we ran it over, and so it, it didn't come. So I th we're, we're working on finding ways to ensure that the balanza clover in the furrow uh, is able to continue. We like the balanza clover because it's fixing nitrogen. It also has a beautiful little white flower that the beneficial insects and the pollinators like. In addition to that, where we have our furrow planted on marginal ground with slope that seals up and runs water off the field every time you irrigate and pretty quickly once you start the irrigation, we're finding that when you have roots in the furrow, all the water goes down and, and really... I think that's going to mitigate some food safety issues because once you discharge water from a field, it becomes a potential habitat for frogs, which carry salmonella and is a food safety risk. So hopefully our efforts, instead of increasing, you know, food safety with all the biological diversity, we can start to see our efforts is actually improving food safety. Um, you know, if water is a you know, stored water adjacent to farmland for vegetable production is a food safety hazard that, that growers spend a lot of time and money managing. So um mm -hmm. great next slide holly oh, 
Holy, me. Yeah. The good oh. stuff. You want to ask your question <laughs> before you start talking? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, go, go for it. I think that the question really would be, uh, what technologies are you using to sort of quantify your impact or what technologies are you using to, um, yeah, in these regenerative trials? Well, first and foremost, we see these very fancy, amazing agrology sensors that, you know, you guys have developed within the last year. And so uh, the agrology came to me a little over a year ago and said, you know, they've got some great sensor technology and they were right. And I, I asked Adam, I said, hey, what do you think about measuring CO2? Um, I was fresh off a seminar talking about some some level of CO2 respiration and how monitoring CO2 respiration from the soil is a great way to indicate, you know, how healthy the soil is. Increasing uh, your CO2, uh, it may sound counterintuitive, but by increasing your CO2 emissions, it's an indication of soil health. And really, you know, the end result of that is that you're going to be cycling, you know, carbon and in, in hopefully putting into more permanent forms that will stay in the soil longer. So really for us, there is a value in looking at CO2 emissions real time and seeing, you know, what our cultural practices, irrigation, temperature, you know, groundwork, companion plantings, fertilizer choice, you know, every different, you know, metric that's available, we can start to correlate what we're seeing from CO2 respiration and start to see what an impact we're having on the soil. Um, and so it's, it's been great. And, and we even kind of came up with the idea for the modification there to tie in for the sprinkler um, thing, but really the the sensor has really evolved in the last year too, uh, you know, from the research that agrology has done. And initially we were just measuring kind of canopy level CO2. And I, I thought it was amazing every night between two and 6 AM, the CO2 would spike. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's, you know, we see so much more biological activity in the middle of the night. Well, I'm pretty sure anecdotally right now, that's just when the wind stopped and the mixing associated with the the wind um, stopped and we were actually start to see what real CO2 emissions were from the soil. And, and so agrology, knowing that modified their sensors, and now they actually have a bit of a chamber that goes into the soil. And I, you can watch the fluctuations of the CO2 in the soil, essentially seeing the soil breathe. So we love our partnership with agrology. We love the data that we're seeing. Um, not super concerned about wildfire smoke at this point. Um, but you know, all the other metrics are so helpful. So temperature, water pressure, you know, the growers, the growers are able to see what's going on with their irrigation. Um, you know, and so this is a great, great technology. Um, some really fun technology we've been using almost for a year now is the carbon robotics laser weeder, uh, an amazing piece of technology, um, that's really, really expensive. You know, it's over a million dollars, but our return on investment on that on that equipment is 309 days because of the amount of labor that it saves hand weeding our crops. And so spring mix and spinach organically have, you know, we battle the weeds there and the human labor component has always been the solution. But with the carbon robotics laser weeder, and we have two of them now, um, you know, really cutting back on the amount of, of, of people and labor that we have to put through. It seems like we're getting over 95% of the weeds all these machines run a neural network. And so when they park it at night, it connects to Wi-Fi. And if anybody else has trained the carbon robotics laser weeder on a new crop, the neural network will give that programming to ours too. So I remember last year we were doing fennel for the first time and pretty much all the crop, all the, all the machines, no fennel, you know, and so they're able to train it and it's able to distinguish between the plant and the weed. In addition to that, it has a catalog of all of the weeds. And so we actually end up getting weeds killed per acre, um, you know, by species, which is is pretty amazing. And, you know, the, the founder came from the world of data storage. And I'm pretty sure the computer system and the, on that, that is on that machine is the most advanced mobile computing system in the world. And there's patents associated with it. The lighting that they use is patented, has stadium lights that, you know, are specific that flash and obviously shooting lasers. You, have, you guys have a video, right? Yeah. Can we get to the video, Holly? I think it's the next slide.
but it, it does smell a little bit like, like wildfire smoke as we're, you know, uh, burning, you know, vegetation, but, you know, this laser beam hits the apical meristem for something like a 10th of a second. And that's it. Uh, it does best on small weeds. The weeds in here are, are on the big side for what we're doing, but this was more of a demonstration. Um, but it knows the difference between the lettuces and it knows the weeds. And um, it's kind of a terrible video because it's a terrible stand. And I'm ashamed to actually look at that crop because it's not very pretty. But um it's it's been amazing technology. Anytime that you can get a return on investment on something over a million dollars and in less than a year, it's it's a, a great investment. So um, we are trying to leverage technology as much as possible. We have a meeting coming up with some Israeli robotic engineers that are working with VR goggles and suits with sensors on them. And apparently they can have a person in the suit cut 50 heads of the commodity that you're trying to harvest and the robotic arms will mimic it. And with the VR headset, it's able to pick up whatever quality that the person's looking for. So excited we're to see where that's going. And it just, it feels like ag tech in general, um, there's so much investment um, in it that we're just getting a lot of fun and, and exciting tools. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're looking at, you know, production systems with a super alternative view and some super basics, you know, just like making sure the cover crops are there and trying to cut back tillage and, and doing basics on top of the, the highly, um, you know, technologically advanced side of, of farming too. Um, and data is mm -hmm. just such a big component of all of it. So. Awesome. Yeah. It seems like uh, there's a really, interesting weaving that's happening in regenerative agriculture right now, where on some sides we're actually simplifying and going back to the way things were done perhaps in previous generations. And then on the other side, there's this like high technology and, you know, data as an asset. And this really, yeah, this really interesting weaving of high tech with also, you know, some, some very simple solutions. So I love that you highlighted that. And really um, as, as we get into kind of the compliance side for retail partners and for, you know, local and regional and, and state government, data is huge. Everything yeah. is is being data driven and, and so much focus on that. And, and really, you know, they want field specific data. They're going to want it audited and um, they want to know what we're doing. And so really our mindset is we're going to try to do our best. Uh, right now to try to figure it out so that we can have really good numbers, you know, as far in terms of data moving forward. And we think that agrology is, is really helpful. We'll be able to demonstrate how our practices are creating a positive effect. Yeah, we're really excited about that too. I think that that um, in our partnership and just in general, I think this idea of data as an asset and really having growers, not only are you growing your cash crop, but you're growing the data associated with that cash crop down to a field level. And that follows it all the way to the consumer. I think eventually we'll have the, the ability and the technology to have consumers be able to see, you know, the carbon impact, not of just the, the whole farm and they'll know, okay, Braga is doing great things, but of that specific crop and really, you know, packaging the crop with the data asset. Um, I think that the, the sky's the limit on that, but there's still more, more to be explored. Um, my next question was, it's kind of a two-part question. How did you imagine you're going to see an ROI on these regenerative trials? And then what has been the reality on the ground now that you've been, you know, doing them for a few years? So I don't, I don't think that we have an ROI yet. And, and that's because, you know, really it wasn't until we got to the good soil on the healthy soils grant that we didn't see yield issues. You know, again, a lot of promise in what we're doing. Um, but, you know, we're, on sweet baby broccoli that we're cutting right now, it's two to 400 cartons per acre because of irrigation issues that we didn't foresee. We should have foresaw, but we didn't. And so, you know, it, it's, it's not, it has the potential to really pay for itself, I think, but we're not there yet. I mean, there is a small premium that we're getting on the regen, but it's not filling, you know, what we've lost in production by doing it this way. But uh, my CEO, fortunately, is really passionate about that. We got to try things and fail to learn, you know, a better way to do things. Um, and it's obviously going to be soil type dependent, too. It's harder to do stuff on poor soil than it is on good soil. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think long-term, um, there's a potential to really reduce 
um, growing costs. So we can reduce tillage passes. I mean, it's on average, we're spending over $1,000 an acre per crop on tillage. Um, and so if you can start to address those major costs, um, it's going to be huge for us because we don't make money that frequently. It's really dependent on the markets primarily. Um, and when other people have disasters is unfortunately when we make money. Um, but if we can start to reduce some of our costs and tillage is one of them, then it'll make us more competitive, you know, at the bottom line. Um, but we're not there yet because really, you know, well, we planted lettuce and then INSV got it. And then we had a broccoli crop. And because we had uh, the rye grass, the Merced rye go to seed, we lost the broccoli crop because it outcompeted it. And then we had the irrigation issue. And then, you know, we did cabbage transplants and the vetch outcompeted the, tra the cabbage. So it, there's a lot of lessons here. Um, but I do think that moving forward, we're building a model that can reduce costs and really achieve environmental milestones that we're trying to to get to um, and, and, you know, be better for for what we're doing. So we're not there yet, but I think that we're going to get there. We just need to stop making so many mistakes, um, but yeah. they're, they're great mistakes that we learn a lot from. So. I always really appreciate your honesty in that way, Eric. And I think it's so great that you guys are not trying to hide your mistakes, but really, you know, being very public about them and learning from them. And I don't even know if we should call them mistakes. Really, they're, I think they're just great opportunities for learning. They might've been flops, but like in the long yeah. run, I think the learning that'll be gained from it, like that's the ROI. You well, know? And I didn't, I didn't expect my CEO to say, Hey, Eric, you know, these are, these mistakes are good. This is how we learn. I'm like, what is this? What is this? I, I expect more <laughs> pressure, not more support. So, um, yeah. yeah. So it, it's really nice, you know, from from the bottom to the top, and in the team, you know, to be passionate about this and to accept that, you know, when you're trying to, you know, do something new and facilitate big change, that it's not easy. And we don't have all the answers yet, but we're excited. We're excited because we've seen enough. We've seen enough to successes to know. Um, that there's a lot of potential here and, and we're not willing to scrap it at this point. And in fact, we've gone from our initial three to five acres. And I think we have a hundred acres right now that we're, we're setting aside for regenerative. And um, when we talk about regenerative, we're actually, you, you, our, our focus is on, you know, primarily reducing tillage. Um, mm -hmm. We already had so many other regenerative practices that we're practicing, you know, that really, the, the big focus for us is changing how we till because we know even if we can get carbon into the soil, if we do extensive tillage that we're just oxidizing and moving it back to the atmosphere, which is, you know, really defeating the point of what our, our exercise is. So um, to yeah. me, attacking tillage is the, the primary goal with our regenerative efforts because we had so many great sustainable practices along the way previously. So mm -hmm. um, all the habitat and, and really, you know, IPM based pest management um, has been you know, the tools don't work that great anymore. And we found that if we just embrace the the tenants of a real IPM program and start to conserve our beneficials, the product looks great and we have to spray less. Um, so it's it's been very rewarding. Yeah. What an awesome uh, workplace culture, right? To to support that um it's, it's quite revolutionary i think yeah that mistakes are are met with more support and more excitement yeah um, I, while we're talking about I, I wouldn't i wouldn't think this would be if you told me 20 years ago that this would be the case i would call you a liar so um yeah. we enjoy it so amazing while we're talking about irrigation can we dive into that a little bit more um we don't necessarily have to get into the irrigation failure you had but i remember in previous conversations me and you have discussed how um yeah. How's it working? Like, for example, with the Sudan grass, these super tall stands, are you getting water to actually penetrate down into the cover crop? Is it moving laterally more or how is the irrigation system working within um, these regenerative blocks? So I did. So on, okay, first of all, when you, soil type is just so depend is so important, mm -hmm. you know, the, so in the, in the image in my screenshot behind or my little background behind me, that's like a 1% world soil. It, it, it's the Braga Gallardi Ranch. It's an ideal ideal soil. They don't get any better than that. And so we can get away with a lot more there than we can in a poor soil type. Um, as far as irrigation goes, I do think that we saw water move laterally in the planting, you know, that is in my image behind me. Um, because we, we didn't see significant sprinkler patterns and we ended up having six feet of Sudan sorghum. So 
I did uh, run the drone over the top of it and there is sprinkler patterns, but in my mind, you know, it, it alternates between um, regen tillage, the standard tillage to regen tillage, the standard tillage all the way across, you know, three replications of each. And there's sprinkler patterns in both when you look at it from the drone, but I don't think it's, you know, it, it's worse uh, where we have these, you know, Sudan sorghum mohawks down the center of the bed. Um, so to me, that means that we are getting lateral movement and it is an ideal soil. But when we employ this on marginal ground, there's no crop, there's, there's empty spots. And that's why we need drip irrigation. We're also not running more water to do this. So in other words, if a standard set for us is eight hours, which would be about, you know, two inches of applied water, a little more, a little less, um, we're not applying more, you know, to do this. We're not applying more water, you know, to grow that there's adequate water there. In addition to that, when we did dig a pit, you know, in our first region, planting we found roots down to 48 inches that those that sudan sorghum is still in the ground right now they're planting cilantro back today and so those roots are going to come that, that sudan is going to come back the roots are going to continue to grow and when we got down the pit it wasn't wet down below and i think that it's going to be pretty common if you get out with a backhoe and and dig down that you're going to find a, a great bit of moisture down below so i think that those sudan Roots are down there, grabbing up the water, grabbing up the nutrients that, you know, we would be moving to groundwater mm -hmm. um, and, and recycling that back. So, you know, we're going to be getting it, broccoli, you know, we see on average, whether it's conventional or organic, a contribution of 150 to 250 pounds of in back to the next crop um, from all the nitrogen containing biomass. We have more biomass now. I can't wait to see what that looks like when we add, you know, you know, more biomass and what we standardly have. Um, so yeah, the irrigation, um, some lessons there, but it, you know, it's, it's not been, um, a, a big challenge yet. Um, there's uh, weeds seem to be a big challenge. You know, one of the biggest challenges because now where we have this grass in the center of the bed, that would normally be something we would be a furrow or would be uh, cultivated. And so where, we're, we were, where we've been in regen now for three years is pretty weedy, um, mm -hmm. you know, down the center of the bed. But at the same time, my CEO says, don't worry about the weeds. Let's just make this work. And I'm like, okay. And we've got some pretty good ideas about how we could use the carbon robotics laser weeder in the center of the bed, in that grass, in addition to in the seed line. So um, we can start to leverage technology to, um, to help us with that. So... Amazing. Um, speaking of magic that you guys have pulled off with water, uh, I think this would be an interesting time for you to talk a little about the cover crop that you guys pulled off down in the desert, if you're willing to share. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this was kind of preposterous. Um, so really kind of came up with the harebrained idea that we should plant a Sudan cover crop and just give it enough water to get started and then let it go. Um, and see what happens. And it turned out amazing. So at the end of last year, we took, I think, five acres on our Trifolium Ranch, which is not too far from the Salton Sea. It's on kind of the north side of the Imperial Valley. And we were going to plant, we just drilled in Sudan. We ran our performer through it first because after it was, it was coming out of Romaine, it had some weed. So we ran the performer through it. And then we drilled in um, some Sudan and they ran with what sounds like a lot of water, you know, you know, probably 36 hours of water, 24 to 36 hours of water, but the sprinkler no nozzles are really small and don't put out a lot of water, but really got it probably started with about three inches of water um, and then just pull the pipe and let it go. And we got about four feet of biomass and Cameron was nervous about how much it was growing. He didn't think it would grow at all. Uh, he mowed it and then uh, didn't water it. It grew another three feet and he mowed it. And then it grew another foot and he mowed it for the last time. It started to set seed when it was a foot tall. So we got six to eight feet of biomass out of two acre inches, three acre inches of water. And in fact, Cameron now is thinking that maybe these roots actually made it down to the tile lines. And if it does that during the irrigation season where we're battling salts, we actually have a better channel to drainage now with this process. Those roots are still there. 
you know, we've terminated it. Uh, we've applied compost and we're getting ready to put celery in there, but we've kept the beds, basically kept the beds. I mean, they ran a light disc over it and there's no ripping, no chiseling. You know, it was a lot of biomass we had to work in and just put the beds back up. Um, and so to be able to keep that soil covered when it's regularly over 110 down there, we're going to be conserving, you know, organic matter nutrients that move through the soil, we pick those back up from the bottom portions of the soil and put them on top. Um, and so Ali Montazar has been the the researcher down there with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Holtville. And he's taken all the measurements, you know, the complete soil analysis, infiltration rates, and all these different measurements. And he's so excited about it that he's actually put in for a healthy soils grant. And so we had to go to the landowners and get permission because it's three year commitment and everything else. But to be able to keep Imperial Valley ground or even Yuma ground in a cover crop and keep it shaded um, and not do the deep tillage. I mean, because right now, the way that we do tillage down there is to facilitate the movement of salts. I mean, that, that water, that Colorado River water is pretty salty. And so it's all about salt management. And if we can do you know, keep that soil covered and actually facilitate the transport of salts down in a way better than what we're doing right now with tillage. It's, it's such a big win, um, for everyone. Um, and, and we're happy to, to be at the tip of the spear on this. Cause it's like, who would think to do that? Well, we did. And it actually turned out pretty darn good and, um, probably gonna be trying that some more. Um, and, and we did a little bit, you know, last year, with some in bed stuff, but nothing, you know, we were, we were watering it. And so we took it a step further and it just followed the moisture down and it's been amazing. Awesome. Well, we've got a lot of questions stacking up. So I was going to take a quick break and we can do some of these questions and then we can circle back to more questions afterwards. Um, one was, um, how does the extra carbon releases from the healthy soils compare to the reductions of emissions from the reduced tractor usage in the newer reduced tillage program? So I think maybe expand a little bit more about how the increased emissions are actually indicative of healthier soils, which are indicative of more carbon sequestration. And I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. So I want my soil emitting the CO2. I don't want my tractors emitting the CO2. So really the more tractor-based CO2 emissions that you get, the less CO2 emissions that you're going to get from your soil because you're oxidizing that soil, introducing oxygen to the carbon, getting CO2. I think that's a pretty, pretty basic, horrible explanation. Um, but I, really, I love it. <laughs> but, but really it, it's, it, we want to see the soil respiring CO2. It's an indicator of soil health. And as far as the actual data goes, you know, we've struggled with what metric we're going to be using. I think we're going to be using pox C to measure the label bio carbon in the soil. We've yet to um, analyze that. We also could run, we probably going to run some Haney analysis on it too and mm -hmm. look at the differences. We did run a biomakers on the last two treatments on the north side, and we did see an increase in, in, in species. So I think we had about 450 on the conventional tilled side. We had 526 or 536 on the regenerative side. Um, and so, and that's just after a short period of time, we anticipate that that's going to continue to change. Um, when you look at the genetics of the soil, a lot of the microbes that are in there are kind of these resilient microbes that are resilient to, you know, tillage operations, and maybe they're not the ideal ones. And so we're excited to, to look at what biomakers is, is seen in the soil. Um, we're going to be quantifying this. You know, it's a three-year commitment that we're doing. We're going to see a lot of changes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, our partner on this, the, the Marine Sanctuary, you know, they've been pulling soil samples. And so we're, we have organic matter. Um, you know, we, we're getting a lot of soil samples. But as far as the final outcome and even the economic analysis that will all be done at the conclusion of the project. But I can tell you right now that we're emitting less CO2 from tractor-based operations, a minimum of 800 pounds per acre. It's probably 1,200 by the time we finished up. We've got to run those numbers. And that's going to correlate with our ability to increase the storage in the soil. And, and when I talk to my CEO, he he's telling me he, he wants to permanently bank that carbon below where tractors can get it. And so that's why he likes these, these deeply rooted cover crops, because we are going to be mm -hmm. moving 
carbon containing sugars down deep in the soil um, where we can't we can't mess with them. And so we hope that they're going to stay there. And so, you know, one of the things that we're now tasked with doing is starting to measure, you know, our carbon in the top foot, the second foot, the third foot, the fourth foot over time to see if we're actually facilitating that change and banking the carbon down low. Um, and so it, carbon sequestration is a goal. We want to permanently move carbon out of there. And I had a great conversation yesterday um, with the folks at Corrigin about, you know, carbon removal credits and the role of biochar. And so we're just really in this space of, of seeing what we can do. And it's, you know, it, it really wouldn't be our primary focus, I think, getting a crop off, but we're getting you know, pressure from the retail partners, pressure from regulators, and and really, you know, the consumer's preferences are changing too. And so we think we have an idea what that is, and um, we want to lead the charge. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I think it's, I think John Kemp has a, a bunch of quotes around this, where he's saying that the healthiest soil is actually the soil that respires the most. You want that respiration. And the healthiest soil sequesters the most carbon, and has the best soil structure and is cycling the most nutrients. So you can potentially reduce give you fertilizer healthier, costs. It's going to give you a healthier plant. And when you have a yeah, more pest plant, and disease uh, resistance, all absolutely, of it. Absolutely. I mean, this, the sweet baby broccoli behind us is clean. It's clean. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it, there's, there's no aphid out there and you know, it's, we don't even treat for aphid necessarily. We focus on nutrition and growing healthy plants. Um, yeah. and, and we can measure it. So Amazing. Well, I was actually just down there with Dr. Michael, who I think is still here on the webinar. And we were also taking samples right at the base of the Grology systems for a full shotgun analysis, full genomic analysis. So we'll be excited to share that and then also compare it to that respiration data that we're gathering. You know, Absolutely. That continuous, I, yeah. It, yeah. And, and really the, you know, I, I love that we're able to see real time I love that we're able to see real time, you know, data on CO2, you know, coming from our soils, but, but, you know, that, that concept going back of how does this relate to permanent carbon sequestration is amazing too. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the next question we have is on strip tillage. Do you want to take on that, um, that beast of a question well, around we can... why till it all strip till versus, you know, um, other yeah, types of tillage? Yeah, so uh, strip strip till is so for me that's an implement that we used kind of initially a strip tiller, which is it, it, it for us what we did in our in our our third crop as we ran that and essentially just worked the seed lines so eight or nine inches wide by eight or nine inches deep and just work that piece of ground and created a seed bed. That's not what we're doing at this time. I do think that there is a value. For that specific piece of strip tillage equipment, I think that a grower following spring mix and spinach could probably leave the spring mix and spinach there and run the strip tiller and transplant right into it. Um, but what we're using now is he didn't want us, our CEO didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money on a strip tiller. So he made us use what we have, which is uh, the Wilcox performer. And after a conversation, a really salty over our conversation with Alan Wilcox, um, we can do a lot better with that equipment that we're doing. We're kind of run the Salinas Valley special modified um, by, you know, raising everything up to the minimum settings, removing the chisel points where we don't want to till in, in a sense, what we're doing is really targeting our tillage and trying to work where the plants are going to be. And that's it. So, you know, no deeper than eight inches, in, in leaving the center of the bed alone, you know, hopefully leaving the furrow alone. Once we have that Balanza clover planted, we won't be doing any groundwork in the furrows. And so really just taking a look, you know, when we take a look at the volume of soil that we would generally work, you know, down to three feet, you know, we're working 95% less soil when you're talking about a, a 12 inch wide strip by eight inches deep versus working the entire soil profile over and over again, three feet deep. So um, if for, for me, yeah, strip tiller is kind of an implement, um, but the concept that we're trying to do is target our tillage um, to be mm -hmm. minimal, um, minimally invasive tillage, I guess, for what we can accomplish right now. I mean, we can, we will be experimenting with other concepts and designs, but right now the lion's share of the work is, is going with this targeted tillage and keeping the beds which growers have done, but I don't think that, um, 
it is always kind of led to issues when you keep beds over time. I was talking to a, a large grower in Salinas and said that, you know, this one grower had kept his beds over and over again and he was growing product from him and he took the backhoe out there and dug down four feet. And there was an anaerobic clay layer that was just disgusting and nasty because it, it you know, the tillage didn't get down that far. And what we like about our system is that we don't need to use the tractor to get that deep. We can get deeper with roots. Um, and so, yeah. It, yeah. Amazing. Um, so we have a question uh, from Joseph. Uh, speaking of plant nutrition, is there any evidence that your practices are increasing the nutrient density of your crops or that these practices are decreasing heavy metals in the crops? Um, and also, if you wanted to touch on just plant nutrition in general, you know, maybe some sap analysis conversation, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, we might have had a difference at one point. Uh, you know, we, we are, we are looking at it. I don't know that we'll see a difference yet, but I know that on one tour, we were out there with Alba, who um, is an organization locally that helps um, largely Latino um, growers get started on the small scale. And we were out there one day, you know, looking at our practices and we're tasting the sweet baby broccoli and the regenerative was much sweeter than the conventional and tasted better. Um, but I would say that when we went back 10 days later, it was different. So we might've hit a window where we did have something, you know, of a better quality, but you know, after that window closed, it, it tasted pretty much the same to me. We are looking at the nutrition analysis yet. I don't know that we'll see anything yet. Um, it, it would probably have to catch it when it's right. It, it might be a, a narrow window based on plant physiology that we don't understand yet. Um, as far as nutrition goes, SAP analysis and Jenny Garley with New Age Lab, she's been a really important um, partner in all of this. And, and you mentioned John Kemp's work. And um, essentially what we're doing is really focusing on plant health. And my knowledge over the years has come from the work the University of California has done and, and use their soil-based you know, recommendations for so much of my guidance. And it's not entirely been in fact, uh, effective, largely because of the antagonism that we see in the soil, primarily from our irrigation water. And when we do sap analysis, we're looking at uh, old growth and new growth and really start to see what's mobile and what's immobile in the plant. And what we're seeing so frequently is that we're short on phosphate. And we're short on phosphate because our plants are seeing too much chloride and sulfate and other negatively charged anions that are coming in on the irrigation water at much greater rates than what we apply for phosphate. So um, the sap analysis has been key. And, and really with sap analysis, you can increase your plant health to a higher level and start to increase, uh, start to resist insects and disease. And we've been doing that for over a year um, and have had some ups and downs, but we kind of, we got it back again. Um, after some challenges, even the rains this year had a significant impact on our sap analysis results. Last year, we were doing pretty well on potassium. And this year, with all that high quality water coming from the sky and with the cannon exchange capacity being largely occupied by calcium, magnesium, we lost a lot of, we lost a lot of potassium. Um, and so trying to get a program, you know, on the fertility side back to address the potassium issues has been a challenge, but it's starting to pay off. And on our organics right now, specifically the brassicas where we go after it harder, we're relatively aphid free. Uh, in the harvest meeting this week, they did not complain about aphid once, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a lot in this regenerative space and sap analysis is really important um, in just looking at what your nutrients are and looking at where they're at. So if you have adequate calcium in your old growth, but you're low on calcium, your new growth, your plant is not going to be able to mobilize that calcium and move it to the new growth. You need to apply calcium either with foliars or with, with, uh, you know, soil base amendments. So, um, the, the data side has been amazing and thank God for Jenny helping us understand it, but we're getting pretty good at it now. So. And you guys do that all at the soil health lab, right? If people are yeah, interested in yeah. that, so that, they that, goes, to Paul. That, that goes through my business and Paul's in the meeting too. Yeah. Paul Zerby. And he was brought on, um, about three months ago, and he had a lot of experience with sap analysis coming out of citrus and avocados down in the Ventura area. And, um, has been a natural fit is be able to take the ball and run with it. And, um, we just, we get a little better at it every day. Um, I can't, we did it. We did sap analysis on our conventional processing tomatoes in the San Ardo production region that we 
did in bed tillage on in, in, you know, save passes by 80%. And I can't, I I'm hoping that we get a pretty sizable yield increase as a result of those efforts and really getting after uh, the foliar sprays. And in fact, the foliar sprays for nutrients surpass my uh, insecticides by three to four fold. I think we have about $250 an acre in nutrient sprays and less than a hundred dollars in, in insecticides, which is preposterous for processing tomatoes. They've been pretty clean. So, wow. Yeah. So overall in the regenerative, obviously it sounds like there's a reduction in diesel, um, a reduction in pesticide use, well, how about fertilizer and labor? Uh, how are those inputs, you know, in, in the conventional versus the organic versus the regenerative? Um, so on the fertilizer, we've been pretty skinny on the fertilizer, you know, to begin with. And, and again, that's, you know, my lab working on the nitrate analysis. So it's, we didn't have a whole lot of work to, to do there. Um, and, and so that we haven't, that wasn't where we needed to do the effort. We needed to figure out CO2. We need to figure out carbon. And so we kind of had most of that dialed. I will say that, you know, the ability to scavenge even more nitrogen from deeper in the soil um, and bring it back up top is going to be a big, a big benefit for our production system and anybody's production system. Um, as far as labor goes, I mean, as far as tractor passes, it's a reduction in labor. As far as harvesting goes, um, they don't seem to mind it. Um, you know, it's, it's the Sudan, is, the Sudan sorghum has got a soft leaf. They're not complaining about it. They would actually complain about the ryegrass to some degree because the leaves get a little sharp. Um, you know, the full financial benefit or lack of benefit will be known at the end of the project. But, you know, kind of anecdotally, we are saving some money in tillage and saving some labor in tillage. Um, and then on the harvest side, we're not really, it's not, it's not that different right now yet. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What's been the response from your neighbors in Salinas? Uh, are they kind of, do they think you're crazy or are they curious and interested? Yeah. What's the response been? Well, I, I know in-house they call me crazy, Eric. I'm not sure what the rest of the industry says at this point. I think it kind of depends on the grower's mindset. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it seems like more, the younger you are, the more open-minded you are. Um, and so it seems like, you know, the millennial and the Gen Z people that are working in ag have a bigger interest um, in, in, but as far as Salinas Valley growers, yeah, they, they are showing an interest and we've had, you know, some pretty large grower shippers on the ranch showing them what we're doing. We have an open door policy, um, but we're really, I mean, after, after this webinar today, I'm, I'm going to be touring some cattle farmers from Wyoming that want to see what we're up to. And so, you know, we've had Kiwis from from New Zealand on the ranch and they wanted to come back, but we didn't have anybody to, to take them around. And so we are doing a lot of tours showing what we're doing because it does, you know, it just the mindset has implications beyond just our production system locally. Um, and, and people are taking, you know, the concepts that we do and hopefully they'll run with it and improve it and then tell us. Um, and so that's why we're open and collaborative in this space is because we know that we can't do it all on our own and that we need to have people help us with it. And, um, it's not just about Braga's operations. It's about the, you know, availability, um, you know, to have, you know, good quality produce available, you know, that doesn't create environmental nightmares in the process of producing it. Amazing. Speaking of millennials and Gen Z, What's been the response from your clients and then also been passing along the response from the consumers? Um, so on the consumer side, I don't have too much, you know, to say on that. I, I know I've seen some studies that I think only one in five people are aware of regenerative. Cal Poly did some work at their marketing and even organics are not, the implications are not known. But I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's coming around as far as our retail partners go. They love it. Um, you know, we've had some meetings with the highest of the highs of, of all of the, the large, um, you know, retail partners, and they're really enthusiastic and supportive of our efforts. Um, and it's, so it's not just Whole Foods, it's Walmart, it's, it's Kroger, uh, everybody, um, has a big interest in what we're doing. And I, I got to travel back to the East coast last September and visit Wegmans and they're even, you know, Wegmans has a small farm that they're doing that, that is, you know, for their, 
they're growing apples that they send to a cider maker and then the cider ends back up on the shelves at Wegmans. And, you know, they have a regenerative mindset there. Um, and they even had a John Kemp consultant that was working with them on, on their stuff there. So um, people know and people learning and people are educating themselves. And, and fortunately, we have a, a good spot to try to facilitate the education. Um, still trying to pursue, you know, what we're going to do as far as certification goes. It's kind of a, a crazy place to be right now. We're really excited by Regen Score and what their efforts are. And I've even done the enrollment process, but we're kind of having a, a bit of an effort getting, you know, stuff turned around back to us. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, in the same time, you know, CDFA is looking at how they're going to be defining this regenerative word. So um, a, a lot to come. We're just kind of on the early side, I think. Amazing. Well, it's the top of the hour. Um, if you're willing, Eric, I'd love to do a few more questions, but I just want to thank everyone who does have to jump. Um, this is, we only scheduled for an hour, but I think we can go another 10 minutes or so if that works for you, Eric. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, also, if anyone has a burning question that we didn't get to, please put it in the chat again. It was a very long and lively chat, so I might have, might have lost some questions. So if I didn't get to your question, please put it in the chat and I'll circle back to it. Um, but my question to you, Eric, right now is, what is the thing that just has you up at night, the challenge that you just are really scratching your head about, and the thing that, yeah, that you, you just, the nut that you're waiting to crack? It's a good question. Um, I sleep really well. because. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, let's move on to the next question. No, no, I just, uh, what is the biggest challenge? So for me, it's, it's how are we going to do spring mix and spinach how are we going to do spring mix and spinach that is mechanically harvest on a single 80 inch bed um you know it's great that we're getting some cilantro out there we we, we know that we're going to be losing yield because we're not planting the center of the bed um, but we're going to see that distinction so any kind of the 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 80 inch bed full coverage planted parsley, cilantro, spring mix, spinach, baby greens. I'm wondering how those fit in. Um, I will say that I can see that there's a lot of opportunity coming out of those and going into other crops. Um, Is that because it, of the weed pressure? No. Or what are you most worried about? So I, I don't know how I'm going to have a companion planting in, in mechanically mm -hmm. harvest, you know, uh, it's, yeah. you're, it's a full coverage planting, you know, that's wall to wall and you have to make yield to even, you know, have a chance at making money. And if we take any, you know, square footage out of that equation, it, it won't make money. And then the way that we have to mulch the bed and prepare the bed and get every, I just, I, I wonder how we're going to do that. I'm kind of not even focused on it right now. Um, but that's one of my big questions. I can see how we can implement, you know, these practices on to anything um, that we're growing that goes in a box and doesn't get processed right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we've, we've dabbled in all of them. The regen fennel turned out great. We've had some cabbage successes. Um, I don't think we've had any cauliflower yet. Uh, we'll probably get more into the lettuce in the spring and see how that goes. We've done a little bit of lettuce, but the INSV got it. But um, uh, we've been really successful with sweet baby broccoli. Mm -hmm. Great. What's the more successful than we would think? Amazing. Kind of on that, in terms of surprises, what have what have been some other big surprises along your along this journey? Um, I just, I it's it's more social, um, and and that's the way that it brought a team together that are just diehard and focused about this. Um, and so th there's a, been a bit of a company culture shift that's really beneficial, I think, um, because there is really buy-in from top to bottom. Um, and, and so I, I do like that a lot. And that was not foreseen that we would get, whether it's sales or marketing or production, um, you know, harvest, um, you know, management, it's all, everybody is been incredibly supportive and encouraging and understanding and it's it's been a big team effort and I, I, to me that's been the biggest improvement it's just kind of the the social aspect and the company itself is mm. super positive super positive yeah that's amazing it's uh and, social and I'll tell you, we're, we're getting we're getting people that are coming uh, high level talent coming to us looking to be part of the team 
Um, and so that's, it's like, really? Because they like the direction that we're going, we're actually attracting great talent. So um, it's, it's like, it's regenerating all parts of the ecosystem, you know, yeah. the human community, the work culture, the talent pool. It's great to hear that culture, that culture shift. Um, we have another question from Chris, our friend, uh, Chris at Wilbur Ellis. How are you currently tracking all of your data inputs for audits, compliance, et cetera? Okay, so we keep track of every drop of fertilizer we apply. Uh, Agarine keeps track of the pesticide applications. We're monitoring CO2 real time with um, our agrology arbiter system. Uh, Intelliculture keeps track of you know, the amount of hours, RPMs, and eventually diesel consumption that creates CO2. Um, you know, there's a lot of data in the planting schedule. Um, and so there's just a, you know, we have tons and tons of soil results. And actually that's something we're trying to do a better job is looking at soil results. So soil results. Now we have plant sap analysis, fertilizer applications, tractor passes, size of tractor, timing of tractor, amount of water we, we apply. We have flow meters in all the ranches that are tied to, you know, um, in Davis weather stations, we can see what our flow is. And so we're, we're grabbing data everywhere. Some of the challenges that we're going to be having is how to assimilate all that data and what does it mean? We're kind of just here and there and, and really probably far too many databases that we're using for all of this information. Um, so I think one of the goals is going to be to do a better job of managing that data. So unfortunately right now we're in, we're pulling data from different pieces and parts to kind of put it together to make sense of it. Um, but there's a lot of data coming in. I mean, it, but the most, the most important, um, data likely to my boss is yield. So, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's our, our primary indicator, you know, is yield. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have another question uh, that was put a, a few minutes ago is why mow the Sudan? Um, and then he goes on, let it reach max biomass and produce more exudates. Um, no reason to mow a summer cover crop until ready to terminate. Roller crimper, roller crimping Sudan is a very effective way to do this. Um, what's your what's your response to that? Um, so I think it kind of depends like the Sudan that you see in, in behind my head was not mowed. Um, when I tell the growers in the desert that we're going to plant some Sudan grass, pretty hard to stop them from mowing them when I'm 500 miles away and they want to mow it. Um, I am pretty sure though, that if we mow Sudan grass, we can get the roots to go a little deeper and a little wider. Um, I heard there's a physiological response for that. Um, and so, yeah, mowing isn't, you know, uh, it, when when we had this cover crop and it could have been seven feet and got a picture of it, you know, it's more tractor passes when you mow it. And so that wasn't the ideal situation, but I, sometimes growers are going to do what growers are going to do. Um, but we're we're figuring it out as we get more formalized trial protocols, because a lot of stuff that we're just doing is let's let's take this five acres and see if we have this crazy idea works. And um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of improvements. A roller crimper is a great way to to really, um, you know, terminate more than the Sudan, but our, our, our Merced rye that we plant as well. So um, yeah, there's a lot of things that we got to get into. But the fact that we're able to even break outside the mold that you know that that Spreckles brought from Germany in the 1800s for sugar beet production to start to mix in some variety. Um, is is encouraging and so yeah yeah we we're going to be doing more and in, in trying to let stuff go but when we plant sudan 45 days before we plant a crop it gets way too tall and now it's receding and so we again just more lessons but um those points are all very valid mm, excellent um well i'm just going to do a few more questions i'm going to try to end it at 110 but um you know again thank you everyone who has come and participated this has been a really great um, discussion and any last questions, please throw them in the chat. But while we're waiting for those, uh, Eric, what's your advice for other growers who are looking to transition uh, to regenerative production, either from conventional or organic? Um, take your craziest idea and do it on something that you can afford to experiment on. Um, you know, what, what, when you see what we do, how does it apply to what you're doing and how can you tweak it and make it better for your production system? Um, and, and be collaborative because it's, 
I was brought into this Salinas Valley with a hyper competitive siloed mindset. And if I would have maintained that mindset, um, I don't think a lot of this would be possible right now. And I, my CEO too, I think that he's just been so supportive and the rest of the team as well um, of, of trying to get, you know, think outside the box a little bit. And if you have a crazy idea, try it, but just don't make it, make it small scale. So it doesn't hurt too much. Um, and then and, and if somebody tells you that that didn't work for them, you know, maybe try something different. So or are modify it. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Uh, was there any last questions that I didn't ask Eric that you wish that I'd asked or anything you want to share to kind of close us out? Um, no, there's somebody who mentioned sunflowers. I think I saw that in the chat. Um, oh, yep. I, we, we, we should probably try that. I think that they're, I know that there's a grower in Hollister that's using sunflowers as a trap crop for diabrotica. Sometimes we get diabrotica issues. Uh, we have had multi-species um, companion plantings. At one point, we planted an 18 species full coverage cover crop and then tried to band out a spot to plant with a flame thrower we got from Christopher Ranch. But then we just kept cooking everything. But it was nice afterwards because the sunflowers made it. So then we had sweet baby broccoli with sunflowers poking up everywhere. So um, yeah, we're not we're not set on Sudan. You know, we're not set on on grasses. Um, but I, I think that really what we are set on is deeply rooted, um, you know, facilitating aeration and drainage. And I think that the more species that we can incorporate, um, the better it will be. However, when we start to talk about utilizing the carbon robotics laser weeder, we're kind of pretty much single species right now, I think for the most part. So if we start to plant our mohawks with a mix, we may not be able to, to laser weed them yet. Um, hopefully mm -hmm. they'll be changing that too. So awesome, Eric, thank you so much for your time and your honesty and um, yeah, just the open collaborative nature of everything you guys are doing at Braga. You really are an inspiration, I think, to us at Agrology, but also uh, obviously a pretty wide community of people who've come here. So just really appreciate, um, yeah, that, that beautiful honesty and transparency. And um, if anyone has any additional questions, they can reach out to me. Um, at charlie at agrology.ag. Um, I'm sure you can track down Eric on LinkedIn or something. Yeah, it's, um, er, it's Eric, and I think we'll... eric.morgan at bragafresh.com. All right, there you go. You got the direct line to the man himself. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And uh, we'll see you hopefully at the next webinar. Thank you so much.